Hello there. I want you to imagine something for me. Imagine if I asked two people from every U.S. state a question about anything. Whether they liked mashed potatoes, or whether they were against abortion, or some other equally controversial question. Now, after I get my answer, I'll write up an inflammatory report that reads, X percent of Americans support... blank. All of this based on a sample size of a hundred people questioned. That'd be unfair of me, right? You could almost say intellectually dishonest, right? Keep this in mind as we go on. Recently, I've been sent a video made by Reality Check, a show made by Ben Shapiro in 2014, where he makes outrageous claims, among them being the supposed truth about Thanksgiving, which apparently was that it wasn't those nasty evil Native Americans that helped the pilgrims, but a single good Native American convert to Christianity. This is supposed to justify the subsequent genocide, I guess. He then essentially glorifies the religious fanaticism of the Puritans when they came to America, pretty much praising them throughout, and ends with saying the pilgrims established communism, and since God seemingly decreed that communism shall always fail, their commune failed. The rest of the videos are boomer tier Obama bad nonsense and uh, police brutality apologist drivel, really. With such logically rigorous work like this, it's unsurprising that this little show of his, basically a discount Prager U, except only has one shitty guest rather than a chorus of them, crashed and burned only a couple of months after it was launched. Now, why am I even looking at this nonsense? Well, normally I wouldn't. Considering it's Ben Shapiro, the views for this little series are somewhat crap, with most hovering around 200 to 400-ish thousand. One video stands out, though, and that's the one sent to me. It's his video titled, Ben Shapiro, The Myth of the Tiny Radical Muslim Minority, with a whopping 4.3 million views. Being Muslim myself, I thought I can comment on this in hopes of educating some people. It's very short and very wrong, so let's take a look at it, shall we? Hey, I'm Ben Shapiro with Reality Check. A couple of weeks ago, HBO's Bill Maher got into it with the Islamic expert and horrifyingly mediocre act Ben Affleck over whether Islam was indeed a violent religion. Here's the exchange. He begins this video by mentioning an exchange from an actor and a talk show host, where he says he'll show the exchange, but shows like four seconds of it, and then moves on as if that was a meaningful thing to include. There is no point here, I just found that funny. Regardless, I don't care for the clip, so let's get to our baby boy Ben's arguments. He claims, to say that Muslim terrorism is only done by a minority is fallacious, because the majority of Muslims are apparently radicalized already. His entire premise rests on something never properly defined, in hopes of having viewers fill in the blanks with whatever presuppositions they have. He uses the term radical and radicalized, but doesn't actually qualify what he means. He basically made up his own unpeer-reviewed definition, which he doesn't give, by the way, a rigorously scientific application by Mr. Logic and Facts. If you're interested in a more nuanced discussion, take a look at the article A Multidimensional Analysis of Religious Extremism, where this question is properly approached. Ben's entire argument is for some middle-aged white guy in Arkansas or something that has never met a Muslim. Ben is essentially telling him, Oh yeah, you should be afraid. They're everywhere, and there are a whole lot of them. Ignore silly things like research and science, but be afraid. Now the question isn't whether Islam itself is violent. It's what its adherents believe, because that's what they act upon. There's plenty of violent material in the Old and New Testaments. Hey, I'm an Orthodox Jew. I read the Old Testament a lot. But believers in those particular texts are not currently ramming airliners into towers, or beheading journalists, or mutilating female genitalia. He starts off his argument by the usual claims of these conservative types, that a lot of religions contain content that can be considered violent. That's true, and there's usually context around that content, but these types aren't too fond of context. Regardless, his argument is that those believers, of meaning of other religions, aren't currently ramming planes into towers, killing journalists, or carrying out FGM. What he's trying to do here is essentially other Muslims generally. It's an attempt to associate Muslims with a certain act. Interestingly, this discussion, and Ben's framing, of radicalism doesn't touch far-right violence, typically done by young white men. In fact, it's the most common form of terrorism in the US. The overwhelming majority of quote-unquote lone wolf attacks, too, are committed by whites in the US. If Ben truly were worried about radicalism, where's his video discussing the dangerous and increasing trend of young white guys shooting up schools, crowds, and places of worship? Far-right terrorism is far more common and much more deadly. He doesn't realize that the perception of overrepresentation of Muslims as perpetrators of attacks is simply due to higher coverage if the attacker was Muslim in the first place. By the way, this isn't even mentioning what the US and NATO did in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, etc., which definitely was terrorism, but isn't considered so because it gets the colonial stamp of approval. But no, Ben would like no nuance here, just a bunch of barbarian brutes. He repeats this at the end, too, where he mentions a statement to civilized people, implying Muslims aren't. What he's done is essentially putting ideas in the listener's head and saying, don't think too hard about this. Now let's just think aloud here. The uh, planes and buildings comment, well, that happened once, and it wasn't a religious expression, it was a political act against imperialist meddling in the Islamic world by the US. 
Now, that's not to say that it was right to target civilians. It wasn't. And this is clear as day in the Islamic legal corpus and is reflected in opinion polls of Muslims, too. A 2007 poll found that 6% of Americans felt that, quote-unquote, attacks in which civilians are targets are completely justified. Only 4% of Saudis and 2% of Iranians thought the same. A 2017 poll found that, when asked whether targeting and killing civilians can be justified to further a political, social, or religious cause, 84% of U.S. Muslims said such tactics are never or rarely justified. In comparison, in a survey of the U.S. public as a whole, only 59% said it's never justifiable. The equivalent percentage for the U.S. Muslim population was 76%. That said, it was never justifiable. By his own methodology, Americans are even more radical than these horrible, horrible Muslims. That's not even bringing attention to other populations and religious traditions, so-called radicalism, from the Central African Republic, for Christian examples, Myanmar, for Buddhist ones, India, for Hindu ones, and Israel, for Jewish ones. Of course, it's unfair and incorrect to cast entire groups by the actions of minorities within those groups. I know this because I have sense. Ben doesn't, nor does Ben show that nuance. I wonder why. Well, we know why, because he's a little weasel, but that's neither here nor there. His second point, of dead journalists, um, Ben, I don't know if you know this, but your favorite Zionist ethnostate is very fond of murdering journalists. You'll see this a lot from our baby boy. He'll denounce something to the ends of the earth, but that same ethnostate he loves is very fond of doing those very same things, yet not a single condemnation from his side. This isn't whataboutism. The fault in his argument is again missing the political dimensions and nuance. Mexico, an intensely Catholic country, is the most dangerous place for journalists in the world. Does that mean Christians are incompatible with the modern concept of journalism? No, of course not. The handful of attacks on journalists carried out by Muslims have been the exception, an absolute minority, not the rule. The only reason it may appear otherwise is, again, because of increased media attention to Muslim perpetrators. Looking at the research compiled by the UN, controlling for other factors, an attack perpetrated by Muslims is covered significantly more than other terrorist attacks, and much attention is given to attacks in Western countries, despite 96% of the victims of terrorism in 2016 being in Africa, the Middle East, or South Asia, and usually being Muslims themselves. This is how and why Ben can get away with spewing nonsense like this and be believed. People exposed to mostly Western media probably just don't know better. Anyways, his last point, the one on FGM, is just very, very wrong. Firstly, this is an issue across the world, not just in the Islamic communities of East Africa. Ethiopia, a majority Christian country, has to deal with FGM as well, for example. Secondly, the vast majority of Muslim countries do not and have not historically practiced FGM. Thirdly, it is religiously impermissible to do so, and no evidence exists to justify the act of FGM in the Islamic legal corpus. When something persists in a religious population, despite it being impermissible according to that religion's rules, it's usually a cultural thing, usually linked to rural populations, poverty, and a lack of education. For example, FGM in my country, Iraq, exists solely amongst poor, rural, mostly peasant Kurdish families in the very north of the country. Why does it happen with them, but not with the rest of Iraqis? For the same reasons given above. It wasn't historically a cultural practice in the rest of Iraq. The rest of Iraq is generally better off and is generally more educated than those peasant families. As you may expect, then, with improvements in education, increased urbanization, and improved well-being, the practice would be declining, which it is. That's the actual truth, and what the research has shown. So, let's examine the question. Is radicalism in the Muslim world a tiny minority phenomenon? So to answer that question, we need to define our terms. We're, we're really not talking about people who are active terrorists. Radical beliefs are a lot broader than terrorists, and anybody who argues otherwise is being naive or foolish or disingenuous. But... Terrorists draw their moral, financial, and religious support from those who are not terrorists themselves. So, who are the radicals? Ben Affleck actually was right on this. There are approximately 1.6 billion Muslims on the planet, and they're from 49 different countries in terms of where they have a majority. All the population stats, by the way, are from Pew Research as of 2011. Indonesia is the world's most populous Muslim country. It's got almost 205 million Muslims living there. According to one 2009 poll, it showed almost 50% of Indonesians actually support strict Sharia law, not just in Indonesia, but in a lot of countries, and 70% blamed the United States, Israel, or somebody else for 9-11. Here's why I decided to actually comment on this video. Blaming Bush, or the US, or anyone else for 9-11 is valid, even if you don't consider it to be. If the United States wasn't meddling in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, North Africa, etc., then those same groups would have never targeted the United States. In fact, they explicitly targeted the U.S. as a result of U.S. actions in the region. They were wrong in targeting civilians, but let's not pretend that it's completely outrageous to suggest that the U.S.'s role in supporting those groups in the 70s and 80s against the Soviets didn't create the issue in the first place. Secondly, and this is the part that irked me, such and such percentage of Muslims in X country support Sharia law. He's relying on the fear factor of the term Sharia law and banking on non-Muslims not actually knowing what it means. 
Essentially, he's banking on the ignorance of people to push an ideological point. Firstly, it's just Sharia, not Sharia law. Sharia literally means the way, usually to a well or other water source. The term is used to refer to canonical Islamic law, derived from numerous sources, and is meant to guide every aspect of a Muslim's life, and in particular, those in relations to religious practice. Saying Sharia law is like saying law law. Basically nonsense. Regardless, what does this include exactly? Well, how to pray, for example. How you should do your wudu, which is the ablution necessary prior to praying. It includes how to fast, the when, where, and how, and how one should give charity. It discusses how one must do their pilgrimage to Mecca, how marriage contracts should be drawn up, inheritance, legal contracts, business transactions, I can go on for a lot longer. Think of it, and it's most likely already part of the Islamic legal corpus. When a Muslim hears Sharia, or Sharia as it's properly pronounced, they think of what I just described. Now let's say what Ben said again, but with this nuance added. Such and such percentage of X country's Muslim population believe in following Sharia, meaning the religious rulings of their religion on prayer, fasting, charity, inheritance, marriage, business contracts, etc., etc. All of a sudden, it just sounds like a stupid and pretty self evident thing to say, no? The reason he said this is because of the way Western media has portrayed the word Sharia, many non Muslims now consider it to mean, I don't know, what Al Qaeda does. Again, he's banking on the ignorance of his audience. Interestingly enough, there are no shortages of religious refutations of these extremist groups, and I can recommend one excellent one in particular, titled Refuting ISIS by Sheikh Mohammed al Yahoubi. It's available in English translation, so look it up if you're interested. If you're interested in reading more about Sharia and concepts around it, including the oh-so-controversial punitive laws, I included links in the pinned comment to some excellent Yaqeen Institute articles, which are pretty heavily academic, and some corresponding infographics, which are easier and quicker to read summaries. I think they'll be equipped to at least increase your level of understanding of the topic, if not outright answer your questions directly. Let's continue with the clown show. So, you make that calculation, it's about 143 million people who are radicalized. You scared yet? We're just getting started. (sighs) You see what I mean? Okay, Egypt, 80 million Muslims. According to that same 2009 poll, it showed that 65% want strict Sharia law in every Islamic country, and almost 70% said that they had positive or mixed feelings about bin Laden. So that's 55.2 million more radicals. He's going to repeat this nonsense of naming a country, throwing a percentage that supports Sharia law, which I remind you to Muslims simply means following the basic tenets of their religion, and then throwing a number in the millions of people that are radicalized, apparently. Ooh, spooky. His mentioning of bin Laden is just silly. To Americans, he may be evil incarnate, but he viewed himself as an almost anti-imperialist figure of sorts, one that attempted to defend Muslim lands. I disagree with him, and consider his methods very flawed, but can you really fault, I don't know, Iraqis, for example, of having mixed feelings about a guy who made a big show of fighting the government that destroyed Iraq numerous times, and resulted in the unnecessary murder of millions of their own countrymen? I'm not saying it makes them right, but it isn't an illogical position. If a black person in apartheid South Africa had mixed feelings about, or thought it was sometimes justified, to attack Afrikaners, you can disagree, but you can't claim to be bewildered as to why they'd think so. Same goes for Vietnamese people during the illegal American aggression against Vietnam. I hope you see what I'm saying here. Regardless, let's add some more nuance. I'm going to quote from the article, The Myth of Muslim Support for Terror. Terror Free Tomorrow's 20-plus survey of Muslim countries in the past two years reveal another surprise. Even among the minority who indicated support for terrorist attacks and Assam in London, most overwhelmingly approved of specific American actions in their own countries. For example, 71% of bin Laden supporters in Indonesia and 79% in Pakistan said they thought more favorably of the United States as a result of American humanitarian assistance to their countries. Not exactly the profile of hardcore terrorist sympathizers. For most people, their professed support of terrorism or bin Laden can be more accurately characterized as a kind of protest vote against current U.S. foreign policies, not as a deeply held religious conviction or even an inherently anti-American or anti-Western view. Hmm, I wonder why Ben didn't do a little more research. Bangladesh. Not a country you tend to think of as Muslim, but there are 149 million Muslims living there. As of 2013, just over a quarter said suicide bombings or targeting of civilians was sometimes justified. Another 82% want Sharia to be the official law of the country, and two-thirds said honor killings of women can sometimes be justified. Honor killings. Two-thirds. It's 121.9 million radicals. He continues the trope he's been carrying on for a while now, mentioning the Sharia thing we already talked about, and something interesting. Attacks on civilians being justified by a quarter of Bangladesh. Interesting that he didn't highlight all the other places Pew surveyed and found 3%, 10%, 12%, etc. Now go right for the highest. What if I told you the same exact percentage supports the same exact thing in the US? 46% of Americans think that bombing and other attacks intentionally aimed at civilians are never justified, while 24% believe these attacks are often or sometimes justified. Contrast this with data taken the same year from some of the largest majority Muslim countries, 
in which 74% of respondents in Indonesia agree that terrorist attacks are never justified, in Pakistan, the figure is 86%, in Bangladesh, 81%, Iran, 80%. If you want to play the numbers game, then the American population is even more radicalized, according to this methodology. I hope you see how silly all of this is. Regardless, this support isn't for religious reasons, but for political ones, I think that's self-evident. On the other hand, though, this is also an issue of lack of education on the part of the Muslims polled. Islamically speaking, it is never justified. Whole books have been written on this. This only reinforces the fact that it is political and not something inherent to the evil Muslimics. Still, though, you see higher support for these things in countries that are, one, usually politically unstable, and two, relatively uneducated. Same issue goes for honor killings, for example. This is a cultural practice that has no place in Islam. It's incredibly common among Hindu populations in India, for example. In Iraq, Yazidis, a non-Muslim group, are notoriously known for these things. These aren't religious phenomena, these are cultural factors. If people like Ben really wanted these things to change, he'd support initiatives that do exist in these countries that attempt to properly educate the population using appeals to things that hold weight to them. I recommend reading another great article on this topic that I've linked in the further reading section of the pinned comment. Go check it out. Here is the total of the countries that we've gone through just now. 680 million, 30,000. 680 million, 30,000 radical Muslims. And that's out of a total population in those countries of 942.4 million Muslims total. And it seems fair to assume that similar proportions of people in countries like, say, like Algeria, Syria, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Tunisia, Somalia, and Libya are also radicalized. And if they are, then, well, we're above 800 million Muslims who are radicalized. More than half the Muslims on Earth. That's not a minority. That's now a majority. And that's still not even surveying hundreds of millions of Muslims in other countries. In other words, the myth of the tiny radical Muslim minority is just that. It's a myth. And, unfortunately, it's a myth that's going to get a lot of civilized people killed. Oh, Lord. A general comment, though, because you get the idea of his video. You see that he generalizes the Pew Research polls to populations of sometimes hundreds of millions. Indonesia is 200 million, Nigeria is over 70 million, Egypt's 90 million, on and on. Interesting how he doesn't mention the sample sizes of the research he's citing. At the most, it was a survey of 1,100 people, and at the least, it was just a few hundred. Yes, generalizing flawed definitions of radicalization based on small sample sizes and the ignorance of your audience to literal hundreds of millions of people across the world is a very honest and rational thing to do. You get 100 people. 23 said yes to some controversial this or that, and all of a sudden, a whole quarter of Pakistan's hundreds of millions also support that same opinion. Funny how that works. Incorrect and harmful ideas should be corrected. There's no question about that. These issues are real and do in fact exist. We should follow an approach of how to ideologically, theologically, and politically correct and neutralize these views. Not only this, but they should be approached in a way that the population in mind would be most receptive to changing their habits. Finger wagging coupled with a drone strike or two isn't how that's going to happen. The imperializing of these countries, along with bombing and colonial feigned disappointment, isn't helping the issue of poverty and lack of education that gives rise to the more unsavory opinions expressed. Hmm. It's as if these negative factors directly support the aims of those same imperialist governments. Hmm. I'll let you think about that one. It's more than obvious that our favorite twink, Ben Shapiro, is just a shitty ideologue that thought he could get some of that sweet, sweet billionaire fracking money if he copied PragerU, and failed horribly. He did spread some racism and ignorance, though, so I guess it is a day's work well done for him, after all. Oh well, if you really want to hear what Muslims think, talk to them. (laughs) If not, I can recommend a book titled Who Speaks for Islam? What a Billion Muslims Really Think, which is the biggest study of its kind into the topic. 